There's a couple that had been married for uh, 15 years, and they'd hit one of those marks in their marriage where it was just harder than it should have been. Uh, their disagreements had, had gotten to a level that were beyond the ordinary when it comes to disagreements. And so uh, they, they came up on this idea, the, the wife came up with it. She said, instead of just fighting over all these little things, instead, why don't we do this? Why don't we, uh, why don't we get two boxes, and these will be our fault boxes. I don't particularly recommend this, but our fault boxes, just those little disagreements that we have all through the day. And, and what we'll do is over the course of a month, we'll start at the beginning of the month, and anytime something comes up, we'll just write it down real quick, quick description on a piece of paper, put it in the fault box, and at the end of the month, we'll, we'll open up our fault boxes and, and walk through the box. So, they, uh, they did this, the wife, very dutifully throughout the course of the month, and you know, here, you know, here it comes, left the lid off the jelly jar, and she wrote that down, put it in the box. Uh, uh, dirty socks in the middle of the bedroom instead of in the hamper. Wrote it on the, wrote it on the piece, put it in the fault box. Uh, wet towel left on bathroom floor. She wrote it up, put it in. Husband, he's, he's putting something in every day too. At the end of the 30 days, they sat down together and started with him. And he started pulling those slips of paper out one at a time, carefully reflecting on uh, the places where he had disappointed or failed in some way. And then, uh, then it was her turn, and she opened, he opened, uh, she opened up her, the box that he had been dropping pieces of paper into. And every slip of paper had the exact same thing on it, every one of them. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Uh, I say that, I tell you that story for two different reasons. The first reason is because guys are way too stupid to do that. And uh, usually we're going to come up on the short end of any story like that. So I found one where a guy was the hero of the story, so I'll go with that one. Uh, congratulations, guys. This is your day. Uh, <laughs> and the second reason, because forgiveness is a big topic in our world. And uh, in our relationships, it is sad, but family members of all people, family members inflict more pain on one another than just about anybody else in their world. And we know where to inflict the pain, don't we? Because we know each other so well in a family relationship, in a marriage, moms, dads, kids. We, we know each other and we know where to jab to inflict the most uh, injury. And the, uh, the, other, the other thing is, is, I think in, uh, we just work harder at relationships everywhere else. Like uh, at work, you're just going to try a little harder. In, with your neighbors, you're, you're going you're gonna to work at it more. But when, it's like when you get home, all bets are off and you just, you just let your guard down. And we can be the meanest at home uh, of anywhere else in all of our different uh, relational environments. And when we're hurting each other, and uh, we're talking about family matters, and we're hurting each other at home, uh, the hurts can pile up and the pain that we carry becomes extreme. And on this topic of forgiveness, some of you came in here today and you're carrying pain. And some of that pain, and I've walked with people in a lot of different settings for a long time, and there are people who carry pain for for decades and decades, and it is heavy, and it hurts, and it is so very uh, burdensome. And maybe it's the past, and maybe it's just fresh as this morning. And we, we have hurts in relationships, in family, friends, work, school, all these places. And sometimes, sometimes those past hurts and, and those wrongs from... Days gone by, they're more real than anything today or anything that's going to happen in our future. And if we are, if we're God's people, that we have experienced His forgiveness, we have come to know what it means to walk in relationship to Him, to have our sin debt wiped clean, we can be no less forgiving of one another. And especially is that true when it gets around to, to marriage and parents and Children and friendships and churches. Anger and resentment and bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. This is going to leave you trapped. And you're going to be hostage for a whole lifetime 
uh, to a painful past. And here's what God said. God wants to set you free from all that. God doesn't want, want you to live with that kind of struggle every day. And maybe it's not every day, but it comes up regularly enough that it just poisons not only today, but it poisons every other relationship in your life. It colors them badly in ways that God doesn't intend for your life. So forgiveness may be the gateway to God's plan. I want to share a passage of Scripture. By the way, I coordinated this well today because we're reading the Bible together. And like a lot of you, I'm also doing some other Bible reading in addition to our church Bible reading plan. But if, you're, if you've already read your Bible reading for today on our church plan, you read Matthew chapter 18 today, and it's a great chapter. It's so filled up with so many different things, but it certainly gives us a great foundation for discussion about forgiveness. And so what we're going to do, we're going to pick this up in verse 21, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Now here's what it says, Matthew chapter 18. And uh, by the time you get to Matthew 18, the disciples are pretty familiar with Jesus. And they're, they're more uh, inclined to ask a question, to raise an issue, to, to challenge. And so here's what it says in Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I did not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And, and since he could not pay his master, uh, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me. I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me. I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked slur servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Peter uh, had to feel he was going to get a gold star on his uh, growth chart on this one. He comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, uh, how often... When, when my brother sins against me, when someone wrongs me, how often should I sin? Seven times? And here's why he, he thought he was going to be in pretty good shape on this one. He thought this is going to be very well received. Because in the teaching of the rabbis in the first century, at the time of Jesus, there was a common teaching. The rabbis taught, God will forgive you three times, and that's it. And then God's forgiveness runs out. And they were basing that on a passage from uh, the prophet Amos in the Old Testament. And if you'll read the first couple of chapters of the prophet Amos, it's this uh, laundry list of all these surrounding nations. And it says, for three transgressions of Ammon and for four, I will not forget. Uh, God says to Edom, for three transgressions and for four, I will not forget. You get three, but that fourth one? You're out of luck. And so the rabbis in Jesus' day, they've taken this and they have made it a part of their basic teaching that uh, God only forgives three times. So Peter, he's a good Jewish boy. And he knows, he's heard this in uh, synagogue school. God only forgives three times. He's watched Jesus. He sees Jesus. And, the, and Jesus is such a forgiving guy and he wants to be more like Jesus. And, and so he says, okay, let's see, what am I... If God only forgives three times, then I'm going to double that plus one. 
seven times. That's an extra generous forgiver in the day. So he says, shall I forgive seven times? And he really thinks, man, I'm, uh, I'm above and beyond. And then Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 77 times. And I know some of your translations are going to say 70 times seven. Uh, I, I really feel more comfortable in the Greek context there with a 77 times. But it could easily be the other as well. But it's uh, way beyond seven times. Jesus isn't saying also 77 times. But boy, on number 78, you know, all bets are off. And then you got a free license just to jump right in the middle of somebody. That's not what he's, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, I want you to learn how to keep on forgiving. That you live, at, the pattern of your life is that you are a forgiver. You are, are someone who forgives in an ongoing way. And then Jesus says, now, the kingdom of heaven is like this. There are lots of examples in uh, Jesus' teaching of the kingdom of heaven. And we think about the kingdom of heaven. He is not talking about one of these days, uh, pie in the sky, by and by out there, this is how it's going to be. When he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the reign, the rule of God on the life of his people. So that's the focal point when we talk about the kingdom of heaven. So this is what it's like. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're one of his disciples, then this is going to characterize how you live as a kingdom citizen. So that's the, uh, that's the focus of this particular teaching story, this parable. Now, in the parable, this first servant, he owes the master uh, an unimaginable debt. This is, it is painted in the extreme, and Jesus will teach that way. He, this is absolutely above and beyond, completely impossible for this guy in a thousand lifetimes to ever repay. It's a ridiculous number that's assigned to this guy's debt. And the point is, you know, you can forget. There's nothing you can do. It's beyond what you can handle. And really, the, the initial response of the master is, is pretty gracious. Because he says, okay, well, I ought to just have you killed. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell you and your whole family and everything you have. And uh, you'll still get to live, though. Well, that's pretty gracious for the day. However, here's what happens. This servant... He just, oh please, oh please, oh please. I will do anything. Just give, give me another chance. I, I, I'll pay back everything I owe. And, and the miracle of this story is, is that the master didn't say, okay, but you better get busy, get to work, make this happen. He doesn't go that direction at all. Instead, he does the unimaginable. The master says, I tell you what, here's the spreadsheet. Everything you owe, and I'm just going to mark this as paid. You don't owe anything. You're, you're completely free of this debt. You, you can go out from here and you are all clear. This is one of those times when Jesus, while he painted the unimaginable debt picture in the parable, he also paints another picture in this parable, and it is of the the extravagance of the love and the grace of God that is so far above and beyond uh, what is reasonable, what, what, is, what would ever be expected. Uh, God giving what was never deserved, what was never earned to us. And we so, we so underestimate our sinfulness. We, we look at ourselves and say we're not that bad. But, you know, there are some crimes that you commit that it depends on uh, the uh, object of the crime, what the penalty is. In this particular case, this is, this is almighty, pure, perfect, holy, uh, eternally glorious God that we sin against. And even, even the smallest of sins against a pure, holy, infinitely perfect God deserves an infinitely horrible, eternal punishment. And that's what the Bible talks about. Old Testament, New Testament is hell. You're separated from God forever in a terrible place because you sinned against a perfect God. That's the big deal. And our, our sin debt is so great. And God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, just wipes that sin away. 
He cancels our debt. He forgives our sin. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the idea that Jesus is really introducing in this particular parable. Okay, so here's where the story really uh, comes off the tracks. It, it gets crazy. The forgiven man, he goes right out and he finds somebody that owes him this more garden variety debt, the kind of debt that you'd expect between a couple of people in that time. Uh, and he, he says, you're going to pay me back right now. And he, had, he attacks him physically. And, and then he, he's going to throw him in prison. Uh, the guy cries out, and it's the same story. Can I just have a little more time? I'm not asking to get out of the debt. I'm not asking. I'm not saying I don't owe it to you. But can you just be patient with me? Can you just give me a little bit more time? And that, that's all I need is just that. And well, he begged for compassion, the first man, and he got it. And now he comes to his fellow servant who's willing to pay back, who's not trying to get away with anything, just wants some more time, willing to pay. And he says, no, no, you're, you are going to prison. Uh, you see in the, the, the guy who was forgiven of so much, do you see his lack of self-awareness? That these, these events happen close together in the parable. And he's already forgotten the incredible debt that he's been forgiven. And he's not willing to forgive really a very small thing of someone else. His lack of self-awareness is, is just uh, unimaginable. The, the smallness of this guy's heart. The, uh, the callousness. We talk about hard hearts. This is a great example of a hard heart. He is callous toward other people. Oblivious to what's going on around him. So what happens is then his fellow servants... They knew about his enormous debt that was wiped clear. He probably came out shouting, Woohoo, you know, this is great. Boy, look, my master set me free from all this. And then, and then he turns around and just goes right at this other servant. And the other guys turned him into the boss. And the boss uh, has a little different view of this servant now. The, the word that, that is used to describe the servant... The master says, wicked, wicked. Now, in the Greek language, the word that's translated here, wicked, it is the harshest, hardest word for evil that you're going to find in the New Testament. It, it usually is reserved for uh, describing someone who is demonic, uh, who is satanic. It's that level of, of accusation that, that comes his way. This is not a... This is not an easygoing term. It's the highest, strongest word of condemnation. Ultimate evil. And the crime is an unforgiving heart. Because God's word says, we are to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. And we have been forgiven generously. Yet we are measuring it out to other people and carefully uh, topped off little spoonfuls. Okay, what is God really like? We grow up with ideas about God. What's God like? Well, some people grow up with that concept that God is, is up there in heaven. He's just waiting for any kind of opportunity to zap us. The first time we get a little bit off the path, he, he's, he's going to knock us down. He, he's going to hit us with a lightning bolt. He's coming after us. And here's what he's really like. Isaiah chapter 43 this is Isaiah speaking the word of the Lord, the voice of God in that generation. And he says, this is God's, God's word. I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and I will never think of them again. See, that's who God is. When you think about it, what is the, the character of God, the nature of God, the inclination of God? Well, he's a forgiver. He is gracious. He, he desires to wipe the debt clean. That's who he is. That's what he does. He's all about grace and forgiveness and fresh starts and new beginnings. And, and once I recognize that God has forgiven me for so very much, then I'm enabled to forgive others. Now, the next verses uh, I want to share with you, talk about how you do that and so we should forgive. How do you do that? And this verse, it's a real core verse for us on this topic, Colossians 3. And Paul's dealing with it because people are dealing with it. 
And the Bible says so much about this topic of forgiveness. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Just like the parable. The Lord forgave you. You must forgive others. And you say, what? I want other people to give me a lot of space. I want a lot of grace from other folks. I want them to overlook a lot of stuff with me. I want them to forgive and overlook my faults, make allowance for where I'm not getting it. But I got a real low tolerance level for anybody wronging me. Yeah, real thin skin. That's how we usually think about faults. But I tell you, when I, I know me. And I know my faults. And I know my heart. And I know my inclinations. I know my sin. And, and I, take, I take a good look at God. And I see the forgiveness that only He can give. And, and because I've experienced that forgiveness in my life, then that's what enables me to mirror what my God has done for me and to offer it up in other people's lives. I'm able to forgive because Jesus has forgiven me. So think about this as an action step for this week. So who is there this week? I mean, this week, not, well, maybe I could work it out. You have to say, okay, for just about everybody here, there's somebody that's wronged you somewhere along the way. And there's a name, there's a face. Who's that person that you need to forgive? And you know, when I say this, I am not talking about going up, knocking on somebody's door and saying, Hello, you are one terrible individual, mean-spirited, evil, and have treated me wrong my whole life, and I forgive you. Because... That's really not forgiveness, it's really a whole lot more about you hanging on to it than it is letting it go, or taking one more shot while you have an opportunity. Forgiveness is something that happens in here. Forgiveness is something you release inside your own heart. And so, who is that one person you need to offer forgiveness to? And you know the first thing Jesus said from the cross? So Jesus is on the cross. These guys are carrying out his execution in, in a horrible, horrible way. And you remember what Jesus said? Here's how, here's how Luke records it. Jesus said, and that's an important part of this verse, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, they do not know what they're doing. Now, when we hurt, when we get hurt, what's the first response? Really, as adults, we're not that different than the preschooler. Or than a preschooler. You hit me, I'll hit you back. You bite me, I'll bite you back. What, whatever happens, I'm, I'm going to go right back at you because I want my revenge and I want it to be instant. Uh, that's how we approach things. And when we hurt, it can quickly turn to resentment and bitterness and hate, and it hangs on and it lingers and it keeps getting more and more intense over years. And we need to learn to release the anger and the bitterness and the resentment and that unforgiving spirit to let that go. Now, here's something you may not have realized, and it goes back to that verse in Luke 23. Jesus said... The Jesus said part of that is uh, a, a Greek imperfect tense. And what it doesn't mean it's not good. Imperfect means that Jesus said that in the past and he kept on saying it. And he said it over and over and over and over. He didn't just say it once and it was all good. These guys are, and by the way, you say, well... As soon as they get their act together and they treat me right and they ask for forgiveness, I'll give it to them. While they were carrying out his execution, they weren't turning back from anything. They were in the process of still doing the wrong. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. In the middle of the action. They hadn't changed anything about what they were doing. And Jesus offers up forgiveness. Now, Jesus over and over. He said it not once, not twice, over and over. He forgave a lot. Uh, if you live with people very long, how, do any of you, just as, just as a survey, this is audience participation time, do any of you live with people or around people? Anybody? Okay. That's about 30% of you. The rest of you live in caves as monks and uh, have no human interaction. So, yeah, we all live with people. And if you live with people, you're going to have to get good at forgiving because this is going to be a part of your journey. You need to learn to forgive. Now, some of you, 
You're carrying this bitterness in your life. It's not the first thing you think of every morning, maybe. But you think of it several times during the course of a month. Certainly during the course of a year. Uh, you're carrying a bitterness in your heart. It's toward a former employer. Or it's a family member. Or it's a neighbor. Or it's a former friend. And Do they deserve your forgiveness for what they did to you? Absolutely not. No more than you deserve God's forgiveness. You didn't do anything to earn God's forgiveness. It's not because you're such a great person. It, it's by grace. Unearned and unmerited favor of God. Anything that you have this forgiveness from God didn't come because of you. It came because of Him. And they don't deserve your forgiveness. The person who's wronged you? No. But we give forgiveness as freely as we have received it from the Lord. And you may have to do that over and over and over again. Until one day... One day you realize the burden's been lifted from you. One day you realize it's not there anymore. That when, when their name is mentioned, when the circumstance comes up, it, it doesn't bother you anymore. And you realize whatever line that was that you're going to have to cross to experience forgiveness, I, I finally cross that line. You forgive not for the sake of the other person. That's not why you forgive. You forgive for your sake. You forgive because you need to experience the freedom that comes through laying that down. Now, remember what Jesus said to Peter. Forgiveness is not going to be a one-shot deal. I forgive him, all done. No, it's probably going to be multiple times. And, and over and over, you're going to have to learn to be a, a habitual forgiver. Because those feelings are going to keep coming back. And every time they do... You need to go back to God. Ask Him for help in forgiving. You see, God, I want to forgive them. I, I want to lay this aside. I don't want to do this anymore. I forgive them again. How do you know when you're finally there? I'm going to spend a little more time on that idea. How do you know when you know, you, I have released the person who has offended me, wronged me, hurt me? When you think about them and it doesn't hurt anymore. When you can pray for God's blessing on their life. When... When you get to a spot where you say, I understand why they do things like they do. You understand they're hurt. Because, because hurting people hurt people. And you, you find yourself having this compassion for your offender. Because you see, you see the struggle in their own heart. And that's when you know you've released them. You keep forgiving them and keep forgiving them. And finally you think about them and it doesn't hurt anymore. How do, you, how do you forget a divorce? You can't. But you can get rid of the pain and you can let it go. Uh, by the way, on that topic, forget, forgiving is not forgetting. That's a good uh, greeting card thing. But it's not a reality thing. Biblically or otherwise. Forgiving and forgetting don't always go hand in hand. See, forgetting, I'm an excellent forgetter. I forget, go, go to visit folks at the hospital, I forget where I am in the parking garage. I just walk around like that episode of Seinfeld for several hours just trying to find where I'm supposed to be. I forget where I put my phone. Uh, forgetting is an exercise of bad memory. The Bible uses the word forgetting for how God deals with our sin. The Bible says, this is God, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, God doesn't have a bad memory problem. Uh, what it means is, God forgets our sin. And what that means is that our sin, when He has forgiven us, has no bearing on our future relationship with Him. That's what forgetting our sin means with God. It, it doesn't affect how we feel about tomorrow. It doesn't affect how we relate to that person in the future. When we have forgiven them, doesn't mean we don't remember what happened. But it doesn't bother us. It doesn't affect our relationship as we go forward. Uh, memories are not enemies of forgiveness. What you do with those memories determines their impact. And, and whether or not you're set free from the struggle. Sometimes we say, I don't want to forgive them. And here's why I don't want to forgive them. And some of you have this experience. As somebody who really did you wrong in a work environment. Somebody who uh, betrayed you, stabbed you in the back. Uh, family struggles at all kinds of levels. You say, it's not fair. 
It's not fair to let them off the hook. It's not fair to, to just turn them loose. They, they need to pay for what they did. It's not fair. They're getting away with this. And just to know this, no, they're not. Because God is, God is fair. And God is just. God is holy. And, and God's going to hold everyone to account. Everyone's going to stand before God and give an answer. And God knows better the timing and the degree and how best to carry out uh, what needs to be carried out for whatever someone has done to someone else, and we can trust Him for that work. Now, the Bible says in Job, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. You're only hurting yourself with your anger. This is a story uh, I, I've enjoyed for a long time. I first came across it. It's a little boy, and he's sitting on a park bench, a beautiful, sunshiny day like today, but he has a terrible pain look on his face. You can tell he's just miserable. And, and a man is walking by. He's sitting on the park bench all by himself. He said, young man, are you okay? He said, no. And he said, what's wrong? And he said, well, I'm sitting on a bee and it just keeps stinging me. And he said, well, why don't you get up, son? And he said, because I got to think I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. The pain doesn't stop and the healing doesn't begin until you forgive and you let it go. Uh, it's unhelpful. And why? Because you always hurt yourself more than you hurt anyone else. And when you get angry, when you get resentful towards someone else, you're not hurting them. And we, we like to hang on to our pain. We really love our pain. And you ever get involved in self-talk in these things? I've done that plenty of times where you have imaginary conversations in your head. Like if you were sitting, if they were sitting across the table from you, all the things you want to say, you wish you'd said, guns a blazing, uh, kind of Yosemite Sam where, you know, you just want to shoot your gun so fast you raise yourself up off the ground kind of conversation with, with somebody. And you're thinking through all those scenarios and you're sitting all by yourself. There's no one around and you're red in the face and your heart's about to explode, your pulse is going about 200 beats a minute, and you know what that other person's doing that you're so worked up about? Oh, they're playing golf. Uh, they're enjoying their grandkids. They're uh, taking a walk in the park. They're, they're laughing at their favorite TV show. They're not thinking about you at all. Because see, that resentment and that anger and that bitterness, it's not affecting them. It affects you. And that's why forgiveness needs to be for your sake, that's why you forgive. Because you don't need to carry that around. And you don't need to have that continue to poison your life. But not just poison your life. But see, when you have that with someone else, it poisons every relationship close to you too. It colors them badly. And we need to let these things go. Resentment cannot change the past. It cannot correct the problem. It doesn't change the other person. It only hurts you and makes you miserable. I have known people who, who had uh, an anger or bitterness towards somebody. And they carried it for a long time. And I've never though known someone who carried that bitterness and that resentment and that anger. That when, when you say, how's that going? How's that working for you? I've never had anyone say, you know, since I began harboring this sense of anger, bitterness, resentment, uh, unforgiving spirit. I've never had more peace in my life. I've never been happier. I've never had a greater sense of contentment day to day until the day I became so embittered toward another person. Then my life was just complete. Now, the most miserable people I've ever known in my life were people that genuinely, absolutely wronged, bad in every imaginable way, wronged, wronged, wronged. But they were holding on to it so tightly, they were stuck. And they couldn't go forward. It's unreasonable and it's unhelpful. You know, and today we come walking here. And some of you, you're carrying a bitterness, a, a heart of unforgiveness. And it's toward, again, some person, some experience, some organization, institution. And you've been deeply hurt because there was somebody just mean, uh, evil. Uh, and... And it's left this wound in your life that is just an open wound and it's not healing and it's not getting any better. And 
And most people don't know it. Most people don't see it day to day. But it colors all of life and you taste the bitterness daily and it, it hurts and affects all your relationships. And we can rationalize this away. Oh no, I'm past that. I'm past that. We can deny our need to forgive. We can claim we've already forgiven. But again, when it comes up, when it crosses your mind, when you think about that person, when someone says, so whatever happened with that deal with... And your face turns red, and your stomach becomes upset, and your pulse quickens, and you fail to actively pray, and you fail to lovingly approach that person, and you think about how they wronged you, you know, several times during the course of maybe a year, then you're harboring a bit bitterness. And you have two options. You can forgive, or you can remain in bondage. And so many people... And I'm talking about faithful churchgoers are held back spiritually. And from the wholeness of what it means to live, live the life of Christ in this world. To live as a kingdom citizen. Because, because they're stuck with a bitterness and an anger and a resentment and frustrations from the past. And it's because a parent failed you or disappointed you or wronged you. Or because a spouse, and it may be a former spouse or a present spouse, who violated your commitments to one another, who hurt you deeply. Or it's a child who drifted away from your values and, and left you a wounded parent. It's a friend who violated your trust, turned against you. A family member who abused you verbally or physically. A church leader hurt you by action, inaction. And what we need to do is we need to, first of all, just acknowledge the hurt. Acknowledge that it makes us angry. But, but don't stay there because that's, still, that's not the, where the road needs to go. We move on to forgiveness and we take down the barriers and we face the hurt and the fear and the anger. And forgive, Forgiveness is abandoning your decision to hold on to and be enslaved by the past. That's forgiveness. There's a, a great story. It's about a little country town. It's an older gentleman, and uh, he finally decided, you know, I, it's not safe for me to be driving my car. But I still have things I need to do. And he was in fair shape for a man his age. And he lived about a mile outside the little town, and he'd walk into town periodically. It's part, partly exercise, partly just because he had to get into town. Sometimes he'd get someone to give him a ride, but a lot of times it was a nice day, not too hot, not too cold. He'd walk in. Well, he walked into town. He went to the little store in the town, and he picked up a big bag of potatoes. So he has this big bag of potatoes, and now he's walking home. And as he's walking home, one of his neighbors sees him. Oh, there's, there's, there he is. I, I ought to give him a ride. And so he pulls over and says, hey, can I give you a lift? And Well, I'd appreciate that, said the old man. And he climbed into the truck and very dutifully took the big bag of potatoes and just plopped it down his lap in the truck. And the guy driving the truck said, well, now, you don't need to keep those potatoes in your lap. Why don't you put them in the floorboard of the truck? He said, oh, goodness, I wouldn't feel right about that. You've already gone to all the trouble to give me this ride. The least I can do is carry the potatoes. <laughs> Too many Christians have said, I, I forgive others for something in the past, some hurt or some wrong, but they still carry the weight and the struggle, and the hurt. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's not impossible to carry. It's, it's something that you can manage through the course of a day, carrying whatever that weight is from some past hurt, resentment, grudge, something wrong. And you're going to get wronged in this life. That's just part of what it's like to live in a sinful world. But th there just comes this point where you have to make a decision to say... I'm not walking out of here still carrying this extra weight. And today, I just need to put it down. And I want to be free from my past hurts, pains, difficulties. And I want to live the free life that God has provided for me. God forgave, has forgiven me for so much more than I could ever need to forgive anyone else. Regardless of how great the wrong. God's forgiven me more. And because what he has given me. Jesus teaches in this parable. I need to forgive. As I have been forgiven. Graciously. Generously. 
above and beyond. And you can do this. Probably not on the first try. But again, he said over and over and over, I forgive. And one day, you realize clouds have lifted and things are clear and my heart is light and the love and compassion and grace of God carries the day for me. And I don't have to carry this anymore. That's forgiveness. Take a step in that direction today. There's somebody, there's something, big or small, and today's a good day to lay it aside. Let's stand and let's pray.